Uh, well, good evening, and my thanks to uh, Christopher and uh, Daphne for the invitation to come, and to uh, Ruth for, and, and to, unfortunately, Mark Garrett couldn't be with us, but Ruth and Mark were kind of collaborators uh, uh, on, uh, on this as well. So, capture all, play. Oh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, my slides are all like crappy, you know, sort of like JPEGs off the internet, so they're gonna look really kind of granular on this huge scale, but anyway, they're just to illustrate it. Now, play was uh, one of the great themes of post the post-war avant-garde. Sometimes it appeared as chance or as drift or as the challenge, uh, or even as what the situation is called, detournement. You could even call it hacking. And the idea was that there could be some kind of practice for making worlds that would be other than labor, and which, unlike labor, might not yet be totally subsumed under the sign of the commodity. But it's in the nature of avant-garde that their most successful attempts to change life end up being recuperated back, back into the commodity form. And there's probably a fairly strong consensus now that this is what occurred, uh, that were once forms of non-labor have been recuperated, uh, that the commodity rules now, even over forms of praxis that are not labor. And that might be one of the meanings of our rubric, capture all. But I think there's actually two sides to that dynamic. It isn't just that play was recuperated into commodity production. In the process, it modified commodity production too. This is not your grandparents' capitalism that we are living in anymore. Maybe this is not even capitalism. Maybe it's something worse. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's different. Awesome, but maybe worse. So uh, thinking from the point of view of the uh, avant-garde of the very late 20th century, uh, with whom I'm a, I was a fellow traveler, and I'll buy a drink to anybody who can name all the panelists. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, deaf in uh, Holland in 1998 for the launch of the NetTime Reader. Uh, so, you know, speaking from the point of view of, of those avant-garde, and I was just a minor fellow traveler of that movement, uh, but what I would say uh, is that we won the battle, but we lost the war. And uh, as I wrote in uh, a Hacker Manifesto many years ago, uh, information wants to be free, but is everywhere in chains. And, and I think in the, the early 2000s, it was the information wants to be free, it was the part that seemed uh, true to the age. But now it's the everywhere in chains part that seems to describe where we are. So information really did escape the narrow bounds of a thing-based property system, and partly as a result of the combined efforts of avant-garde and social movements, but only to be recuperated again at a more abstract level. That's why I say it's maybe not capitalism anymore. It's, it's like something over and above that, like a, a more abstract form of the commodity. Oh, and that was Hack Manifesto. That was a German edition. So when I wrote uh, Gamer Theory, I wanted to have done with uh, any kind of romanticism about the great outdoors. A lot of avant-garde languages in the late 20th century through to the present still draw their energy from a romantic conception of an outside. They celebrate the virtual or the glitch or the break or the, ex or the exploit. They want to break on through to the other side. But what if there is something irredeemably romantic and even theological about this desire that there be something else there? What if the challenge of the times was really to start thinking entirely within systems of constraints? So there is no outside anymore. The planet is now a badly designed game, a game that captures all resources and plays at transforming them all into the commodity form. So in that sense, I think this era of the Anthropocene, and call it what you like, yeah? But I'm gonna call it the Anthropocene. It's really the end of that version of Romanticism that longs for an outside that can be obtained in some sort of Promethean leap towards a world of pure objects or pure concepts. So instead of the virtual or the romantic beyond, uh, maybe a gamer theory of trifling with the interiors of dysfunctional systems is where we are. Uh, and that might be a more aesthetic and conceptual practice that's kind of in tune with the times. And so when I, oh, no, don't have a slide for it. When I sort of rewrote the history of the Situations International, that was sort of one of my goals, to sort of stop seeing them as late romantics 
and to start thinking of them as early something else, as kind of early precursors of the, the, uh, the aesthetics of playing with spaces of interiority, of being within systems. But perhaps some examples of game of theory works might be helpful for thinking through what such a practice can do. And I want to look at two examples that both use my favorite game of all time in its different editions, which is SimCity. Anyone ever played SimCity? We have, a, we have a few takers. Anybody ever play The Sims? We have a few. Anybody ever play Sim Earth? I think I heard one. I'll, I'll come to that one and why, why it didn't work. No, no one wanted that one. Uh, now, the first I, one I want to talk about uh, is by uh, Vincent O'Kustler, uh, and it's uh, called Magna Santi. There's some terrific uh, YouTube video documentation of this work and so on. So, if, like, just write that down and go look it up. It's this lovely, lovely work that this person did, who I've never met. Uh, I first learned about it from an interview he gave in Vice magazine in, in uh, 2010. So, O'Kustler built uh, Magna Santi. Uh, in the SimCity 3000 edition of the game with one objective in mind, and that was to maximize the population of the simulated city. And one of the ways he did that was by eliminating all transport. And I'm sorry, the slide, the fact that it's extra bitty kind of even gives you a better sense of it, I'm going to say, improvising here, of, of like no roads, no trees, no nothing, just, just like mega blocks. So he eliminated all transport uh, and the city is this sort of like bleak repetition of identical units. There were no fire stations, no schools, no hospitals. The pollution levels are terrible. Uh, his sims only live to about 50 years of age. Uh, and yet, O'Kustler claims his city ran with a population of 6 million for 50,000 uh, sim years. I think Magna Santi is a beautiful example, not so much of a, a utopia as an atopia. And the difference is that a utopia is a nowhere, but, a, but an atopia is like a no place, a non-place, a kind of placelessness perfected. But surely you would react, Magna Santi is a dystopia. Its sim citizens' lives are nasty, brutish, and short, and each lived in a tiny radius of a city that's actually identical everywhere within its space. But perhaps there's a certain residual humanism in that line of thought. Whoever said that game space or the game space of a commodified Earth is supposed to be an optimal world for humans, yeah? If we take away the assumption that we're optimizing the planet for humans, then maybe this is actually utopia or indeed atopia after all. So in that sense, I think uh, Magna Santi is a nice allegory for the kind of perfected state of our own world, a world so poorly run that its rulers insist we judge them only by their enemies and not by their results. We're supposed to be grateful the Islamic State is not throwing us off cliffs or chopping our heads off. That's how low the bar is, uh, as far as the ruling class of our time is concerned. For the reality is we live inside a Magna Santi, but whose goal is a bit different from uh, a Kustler's, but no less mad. And it's not necessarily to maximize population, but to maximize the transfer of value upwards to those who already own half the wealth of the planet already. Now, more recent SimCity work can shed a little bit more light uh, on this kind of gamer theory practice. Uh, I recently, again, read in Vice about, uh, that's where I get all my news now, like Vice is my New York Times, I think, you know, that's where they talk about the world I actually know. Because in New York, I live in Queens, and they don't have nothing to say about Queens, you know. Uh, all right, and this is the work of uh, Matteo uh, Batanti, again, it's uh, an artist uh, uh, and scholar who I've never met. He just published a fantastic work of conceptual literature called How to Get Rid of Homelessness. It's a two-volume, 600-page work transcribed from online forums such as Reddit and Simtropolis, uh, in which players of the 2013 edition of SimCity, uh, the SimCity game, talk about the problem, problem of homeless Sims. Now, Batanti uh, has worked in the Bay Area in California and clearly saw the homeless uh, problem in SimCity and in that actual American city is intimately related. The contributors to the various discussions that he documents in the book seem likewise to kind of slip between two realities, which in a way are kind of the one reality anyway. Each is kind of an allegory for the other, and I'm, sometimes I'm not sure if uh, SimCity is an allegory for actual cities or if it's the other way around. You know, as I walk around uh, New York, I'm kind of like imagining clicking on different sort of items to sort of look at their value. Now, in, in SimCity, when your city starts to become successful, or in fact, in any city, when your city starts to become successful, 
One of the problems is that your low-income sims can't afford housing anymore. If you built some nice parks, they'll just congregate in the parks. I think I have an image. Yeah, they just congregate in the parks, like little stick finger yellow icons dragging a bag around. And they drive out other sims and depress local land values. But they don't depress it to the point where they can actually afford housing anymore. Uh, and the best you can do, according to Batanti's documentation, is lay in a bus service so they'll leave town. Yeah. That's kind of like basically the best you can do. Which Rudy Giuliani tried, you know, it's like that's a real world thing. Now the text makes for uh, interesting reading. I cannot claim to have read all 600 pages, but I really did get through a good, good slice, slice of it. Uh, occasionally posters in these forums will have an ethical or even political point to make. But it's kind of striking how much Fox News talking points have seeped into the language of the people posting about this. Uh, one of them insists that in America, welfare recipients receive $65,000 a year. It's like, really? Did you fact check that one? Uh, but what doesn't happen much, uh, and this might be the point of Batani's work, is thinking about homelessness as a sort of necessary product of the algorithm itself. If the goal is rising property values, then the homeless are just one of the effects, and in fact not one that matters. SimCity, like actual cities in the overdeveloped world, are real estate games that are about capturing surplus value in the form of rent. A city that succeeds does so by doing something other than what we would think cities are sort of for. I'm sort of old-fashioned enough to think cities are supposed to like house people, yeah, whereas the, the successful city actually dishouses people. Now both uh, Batanti and uh, Ocasla offer works that are sort of algorithmic uh, or allegorical doubles of the world, although not quite in the way that narrative works are allegories. They're more of the order of algorithms. And I'm using that term here very loosely to mean a procedure with a beginning, a transformation, and an end state. Algorithms are sort of emerging as a, a major object of critical and creative attention. However, I think it's important not to make too much of a fetish of the algorithm or of our other hot button word of big data or any figure like that, they don't operate by magic and they don't operate al alone. And here I think Batani and Ocustler's works are helpful in the way that they ask questions about what happens to the figure of the human within the algorithm. And I think even if you want to decenter away from, from our relentless, people complain about selfies, but it's like, have you seen human discourse? It's all about us. Yeah, like, why should the pictures be any surprise? But even if you want to, you know, decenter it from the human a little bit, it's sort of worth asking what, what that happens to that figure in the algorithm. So let's pursue this a little further by thinking firstly about sort of cities and then about systems. So SimCity has certain limitations as a game in that it only models one city. And even in the 2013 version, where your city can be adjacent to other cities run by other players, there's a sense in which there's still sort of an outside. Uh, there's somewhere for problems to be dispatched to, you know, like send your homeless on the bus to some imaginary bit world. I can get a bus somewhere else. And so it is with actual first world cities, yeah? The cities of what the situation is, I think, usefully called the overdeveloped world. You know, we just sort of imagine there's like just a bus out of there. To make matters even more perverse, a successful city in the overdeveloped world is one uh, where putting up, we're now putting up real estate in which nobody lives at all. According to a story in the New York Times, quote, in a large swathe of the east side bounded by Fifth and Park Avenues, and East 49th and 70th, 70th Street, about 30% of the more than 5,000 apartments are routinely vacant more than 10 months a year because their owners or renters have permanent homes elsewhere, according to the Census Bureau's latest American Community Survey. In one part of that stretch between East 53rd and 59th Street, more than half the 500 apartments are occupied for two months or less. So in other words, this is what we are now creating. Like, it it's now looks like that all the time. There's no one there. In short, success in the game of SimCity, that is actual New York City, includes not just homelessness, but the opposite as well. Fabulous homes with nobody in them at all. So what kind of game is this? It's like a version of Magnusanti where the goal is not maximum population, but sort of maximum real estate fortunes. Uh, and the kind of city that it builds, I want to suggest, is no less weird. Yeah? We're, we're starting to think that this is kind of normal, this is how cities look. But what if we start to think that city as being as kind of as weird as that one? Yeah? It's like, how is that any more strange than like, this piece of bullshit? Yeah? Rip. 
Now, if one were an old-fashioned kitsch Marxist, one might say that this is what happens under capitalism, where the game is a matter of uh, a form of value that oscillates between two aspects, use value and exchange value, but where exchange dominates over use value, and hence production is not geared towards human social need, but is geared towards the accumulation of exchange value in the form of the general equivalent, or money, yeah? general equivalent. Uh, am I going here? Yeah, all right. So one might also point out that such a regime uh, thinks of all values as commutable and divisible and exchangeable and infinitely expandable, as if labor's encounter, encounter with the natural conditions of production imposed no necessities at all. Such an analysis can tell you a lot about the sort of crazy game space within which we are all sims. But I wonder if it's a complete mapping of just how weird the, the game has, uh, has kind of gotten at the moment. All right, so in Marx, money expresses exchange value in the form of general equivalent, a commodity that can stand in for all others. But what if besides the general equivalent of money, there was also a specific equivalent? And beyond that, a general non-equivalent and a specific non-equivalent. Yeah, so the thing about uh, where information occurs in Marx's value theories, it only appears in one form, yeah? It appears as the general equivalent. But what I want to suggest is maybe there's three other terms. And if we sort of expanded a, a, a value theory of information out towards those three other terms, then what might it look like? So this is just a little thought experiment that I'm going to go through here. So this is the, the fourfold scheme, if you like. And the fourfold scheme might sort of more comprehensively account for the forms of information within which use value is organized and expressed and controlled. And so then the four uh, forms of information would be respectively the general equivalent, money, right? Specific equivalent, data, but where we've usually thought of what organizes data and accounts for it as being some sort of science, yeah? So that would be uh, what the specific equivalent is. So it's no longer a general equivalent, it's not like a pure quantity there, if you like. It's general, but there are, you know, sort of specific ways in which data are supposed to be organized around specific objects. Then we'd have the general non-equivalent, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call culture, which is a series of uh, totally made up, you know, sort of consensus hallucinations and myths through which we all live. And then, you know, we can think about the specific non-equivalent, which is art, yeah? Because that's how I think Adorno was, was thinking about the role of art. It's supposed to be non-equivalents. So, you know, the stuff that's in the art world might not ever actually live up to its, its claim to be art, but where you actually do find art, what it would then be is specific non-equivalent. You know, sort of, it's a form of information that, that no longer is either general or equivalent at all, and this actually might be very, very rare. So could we think use value in relation not just to one form of information, but in relation to four? But, and, and then what they do is sort of uh, parcel out four different ways that information could possibly be organized. So there might be more than one kind of information in the world. Even if exchange value, the general equivalent, is dominant and use, the use value of things might also have a relation to the general non-equivalent of culture with its repetitions and permutations on narratives, image, dreams, and desires. Use value might even be caught up from time to time in the specific non-equivalent that is art, which struggles to introduce non-equivalence or genuine difference, even if it gets reduced in the end to the artwork and thus inevitably to exchange. Use value might even uh, have to contend with the specific, specific equivalent, which in these times of big data is a sort of real-time map of the displacement of things as fast as, as extensive as that of exchange value. And that might actually be the real wrinkle of our time, yeah, that, that the specific equivalent caught up with the general equivalent and moves as quickly as it does. So we can know a lot more about the, the things in motion around the world now than their unit price. Yeah? We have all of this information about what's circulating other than, than how many units and what their price is. Uh, so in that sense, it's no longer a kind of uh, von Mies, Hayek kind of world. The problem might then be to reimagine not just uh, use values, subordination to exchange value, but rather the inability of our current deployment of all four kinds of information value to direct production towards human social needs in the form of use value. There might be a more general pathology to the way matter and energy are set in motion by information. 
One might even imagine a key part of that pathology to be the separation of these forms of information as value and their subordination to the general equivalent of the other three. Hence, it's not just that exchange value excludes and subordinates the specific non-equivalent, which for Adorno was art, nor that it excludes and subordinates the general non-equivalent, which for Raymond Williams was culture. Rather, the front line may now be the struggle over the relation between money and data, or the general equivalent and the specific equivalent. For if there is an institutional ideal form of the specific equivalent, it's neither culture or art, it's probably science. And you might notice science is now one of the things most significantly under attack, and I should probably here say, particularly in the Anglophone world, is sort of like the, the front line of science denialism as we speak. So maybe we need some uh, to put some different figures back in the story, some sort of neglected uh, people. Uh, so who, who's heard of Theodore Adorno? Okay, fairly well-known dude. Uh, who's heard of Walter Benjamin? We have heard of him, okie dokie. Who's heard of uh, John Desmond Bernal? Who's heard of Joseph Needham? Ah, we have some takers. Maybe you guys do uh, synology or something like that. Uh, all right, but these are, these are contemporaries. These are people who try to think through uh, a specific intellectual practice and what Marx had to teach. Uh, it's just that they weren't trying to study literature or culture. They were, they were scientists. And we wrote them out of the story. And when you tell the story of uh, critical thought of the uh, 20th century, that their names no longer appear, nor do the names usually if they're equivalents in, in France and uh, in, in uh, Germany and so forth. So I wanted to... Uh, put this guy back in the story, John Desmond Bernal, and particularly this guy, Joseph Needham, uh, who wrote some truly astonishing stuff uh, starting in the 1930s. Uh, and and their, their problem was uh, how could, uh, and, and particularly Bernal, uh, Bernal thought that science and communism were exactly the same thing. Uh, because his experience of science was before big science, was before its kind of massive uh, institutionalization and commodification. So there was this kind of hint that you then later find in people like uh, Richard Stallman, who then later got to experience computer science in this magic moment before it, it all got commodified again. Uh, so are there ways that we could reconnect with that part of the critical theory tradition uh, that thought critically about science, were not naive about it, and by any means were well aware of the pressures it was under to become something else, but thought that there was something that really mattered about it as a way of handling data, that that was kind of key to it. So maybe here we need some forgotten figures, and I'm, I'm going to choose Bernal and Needham, who were engaged in the struggle to preserve the scientific method of assessing the data of the specific equivalent from its corruption either by the market or by fascism, which now are the same thing. Yeah, I, I think we live under the threat of a kind of neo-fascism where those, those become the same thing. So in our terms, they, they want to preserve some way of thinking about data uh, where the general equivalent is, no, is not what subordinates the specific equivalent to itself. And that, I think, at the moment is a really specific kind of side of struggle. Today's ruling class wants to turn data into a form of unequal exchange and control, subordinated to exchange value. Hence, inconvenient data has to be excluded. For example, actual scientific data about climate change or other examples of what Marx called metabolic rift are now to be denied any legitimacy. So I think the struggle then is to sort of rebalance the four modes of information value and come up with a more complex organizational form for the relation of information to use value other than that of capital accumulation, which is indeed the only goal uh, that the general equivalent can kind of recognize. So this might be a sense in which this is not capitalism but something worse. This mode of production not only subordinates use value to the general equivalent and has not only fully subsumed the specific equivalent of art and the general non-equivalent of culture, but it's also rapidly transforming the specific equivalent of all data, the basis of any science at all, into nothing more than a means of reproducing unequal exchange. One of the more absurdist uh, signs of this is that the, uh, in the United States, congressional Republicans have decided that the Scientific Advisory Board of the Environmental Protection Agency should no longer allow scientific experts to report on their own area of expertise because their argument is they'll be biased. If you're an expert on something, you must be biased. Like, that's the argument. Uh, so, because they think 
the experts should be employed by industry because somehow magically they're not biased. Yeah. I'm not making this stuff up. So on the face of it, this seems absurd, but only if one thinks that the specific equivalent uh, data and in its interpretation is in some sense a matter of science. And one, one could argue about what that term means and whether what it actually is always lives up to what it ought to mean. But I think it, it's, it's a value to put back uh, uh, on the table in contention. So in this mode of production, the specific equivalent is to be fully subordinated to the general equivalent. Data only exists to produce inequalities that can be monetized as exchange value. And that is pretty rapidly rendering not only most humans, but most other species homeless on their planet. And that then becomes a sign of success. Yeah? So uh, the sixth extinction is the sign of the success of this mode of production, is that it's eliminating uh, species rapidly and will probably start to chip away at our numbers as well, and yet will continue to flourish and grow in its own terms. Now, SimCity was not the most popular of the Maxis uh, simulator games. Uh, after a bit of a slow start, The Sims became one of the all-time great popular games. And the least successful was probably Sim Earth. And its problem was that it sort of lacked externality. There wasn't an outside onto which to throw the homeless. It fairly accurately modeled what happens when you subordinated a whole planet to some industrialized mode of production and started excreting a whole heap of extra carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. But the best you could actually hope for was leaving the planet. So if you succeeded at this game, uh, one of the ways that the game would end, you know, in the, in the sense of, of a, some sort of win situation, is that all of your little sims on the whole planet would get in spaceships and go to another planet altogether. I once got uh, uh, all the humans died, but I ended up with intelligent robots. Uh, and which is actually sort of the probably more realistic scenario that you could get out of this game. So in a sense, it did have an outside. So it did sort of participate in that romance of elsewhere. And in this case, it was the, the romance of space. But it wasn't a very believable one. When you played it, it was really kind of depressing. You know, it's like, oh, cook the planet again. And uh, I, I used to like set it up uh, and leave it to run overnight. And I would get up and every morning my planet had cooked. You know, it's like, damn it. It's really frustrating game. So in short, it seems we all now live in a sort of magna santi of a sort of planetary scale, yeah, or uh, maybe J.G. Ballard's concentrated city, uh, whose governing algorithm is to capture all work and all play and turn it not only into commodities but also into data and subordinate all practice to the rule of exchange. And any data which undermines the premise that this can go on now for 50,000 years has to be turned into non-data. So we pretend that data doesn't exist or doesn't matter. I think it was in uh, uh, North Carolina, one of the local government authorities uh, had, had tried to sort of plot out uh, coastal futures. Uh, and it looked like a lot of real estate was going to end up un underwater. So the real estate lobby got the report modified so the look forward is only 20 years. Because in 20 years, all the real estate's golden, yeah? But it's just like after that, you know, you don't want to like be, you don't want to be investing in that. It's my, uh, my parting advice for graduating students now includes, don't buy waterfront. All right, so if there's work and play to be done, what I want to say is it's inside the game space that is now the whole world, right? It, it all got captured. So is there a way that this game space could be the material with which to build another one? Like that, that then would be our question, yeah? Is there a way in which the infrastructure of which we are now all like little components uh, can, be, can be doing the work of qualitatively building a different infrastructure than the one we happen to now inhabit and whose tendency is to produce more and more of itself? but where its tendency to produce more and more of itself is in its own terms a winning strategy, but it's a winning strategy that doesn't include a lot of species uh, in its forward-looking uh, horizon and where, where one of the species it doesn't include in its success strategies. So another way of thinking of um, this image is, is you know, this, this is you know, the kind of the, the future that this infrastructure uh, is looking to produce, where there'll be glorious skyboxes, uh, but there won't be any people left to, to kind of service them. So with that cheery thought, I, uh, I, I will leave you. <laughs> <laughs>